Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and uh, delighted to welcome a very special guest today, a dear friend from many years now who uh, uh, years ago sat with me here. I want to say 20 years ago, uh, we, we received her here in Hawaii. Uh, but before I give you more details, let me first just say a, a big warm welcome to Anne Wright. Uh, Anne, thank you for joining us today on Global Connections. It's great to have you back. Welcome. Thank you, Carlos. It's great to be back and welcome back to you too. <laughs> yes. Well, again, full circle, all of us uh, as we move around, but I, I want to maybe just, you know, some of our viewers, of course, are familiar with you, work you've been doing for many years, but I want to take us back uh, again uh, about 20 years ago when we, uh, you found yourself uh, uh, as a, at that time, a, a member of the Foreign Service, a diplomat, and you had uh, an opportunity, which I imagine at the time sounded like, oh my God, this is wonderful, like a a nice leave to get away from the nitty gritty details of, of, of working in embassies. Suddenly you were here in Honolulu, Hawaii, um, as I recall, maybe you can clarify, but it's some kind of fellowship or an opportunity to be connected here with the office of US gov um, of the governor at that time, Ben Cayetano. So you're like an international affairs fellow of some kind. Uh, all this to say that suddenly uh, we had the dramatic events of 9-11, the terror attack. And within a short time after that, Suddenly, you as a diplomat were called back into a very interesting task to help us reopen the U.S. embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, it had been closed for many years after the Soviet invasion. And there, I, I can remember you came back later to share insights from that, what it must have been like. So I wanted to revisit that in a while, but maybe more importantly for our, for our guests, uh, just to make sure we know uh, your own background to me has always been fascinating. I, I think of you, Anne, as one of these polymaths, a person who has some ways many different things in your life because you, you've had a long career with the government itself uh, and now many years as a peace activist uh, engaged uh, you know in, in civil society uh, very much as a pressure on government very important but uh, your career of course includes a long service with the U.S. military the U.S. army a retired lieutenant colonel uh, and uh, maybe just give us a quick snapshot a couple of the areas because you were involved in some important uh, international humanitarian issues but eventually you would come into the foreign service as a diplomat also serving in some, well, some, some tough uh, hot spots around the world. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, landing yourself in Honolulu here, uh, uh, working with the governor's office, suddenly back into service, uh, opening that embassy in Kabul. Uh, later then, as we'll continue talking, uh, very much one of the very high profile State Department officials who would resign uh, after the war in Iraq and, and, and as a voice of conscience, as a, as a protest, uh, as we recall a number of others, and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but all that to bring us to where we are today. Here we are in 2021, suddenly revisiting Afghanistan. It's been with us for 20 years. Uh, rather than reopening that embassy, now we've seen this, uh, you know, very frantic, uh, you know, getting out of town and closing that embassy. So really strange how the world comes in circles. So um, let me just on that topic, because I could go on forever, but Anne, I, I'm just grateful for your ability to share some insights, some perspectives, some reflections uh, from your long career. So maybe just kind of taking us back a little bit from that early, because again, your involvement with Afghanistan, very specifically, reopening an embassy uh, that had been closed. So give us a little bit of that, that background, that story uh, that happened. Well, as you mentioned, I had been in uh, the government service uh, essentially all my adult life. I joined mm -hmm. the Army right after college. I was in for 29 years, 13 on active duty, 16 in the reserves, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, retired as a colonel and then went on to uh, the State Department as a U.S. diplomat and served in embassies mm -hmm. in uh, Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia. Mm -hmm. And then I came to the office of the governor, as you mentioned, yeah. on a, a special program the State Department has to work in state-level government. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then 9-11 happened, and uh, I was selected to be on the very small team of five people who were sent to Afghanistan to reopen that embassy uh, in December of 2001. Yeah, uh, we yeah. stayed there for, uh, or I stayed there for about six months before the first permanent uh, party, so to speak, the first assignments of uh, foreign service officers began. I was there when um, Colin Powell arrived for the first time as Secretary of State, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Zalmay Khalazad, who uh, is now known for being the negotiator with the Taliban. At first, he was the special uh, envoy from the president of the United States to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Then he became the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan and then the U.S. ambassador to Iraq and then the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. So mm -hmm. 
I got to know a lot of a lot of people, mm-hmm. uh, senior level people in the State Department that I had not um, been around before, and also the senior members of the Afghan interim administration. Uh, at that time, uh, President Ham- or interim president Hamid Karzai was the head of the government. Uh, the man who later became uh, president, Ashraf Ghani, arrived in Afghanistan in January of 2002, uh, coming from a, from employment at the World Bank. And he, as an Afghan, said, I have to come back to my home uh, now that the Taliban's out, and it's time for me to help with, uh, with their country. And he became the finance minister and did a lot of economic things first. And uh, then later on became part of the political process and uh, became the second um, president of the country. So I look back on 20 years ago when I was uh, uh, in Kabul and when uh, with reopening the embassy that had been closed for 12 years, that had no telephones that worked, had no computers, had no no running water, no sewage, no nothing. <laughs> And then yeah. trying to race around Kabul uh, in a little car that had been um, pieced together from other embassy cars uh, wow. in the 12 years that it, we'd been gone and mm-hmm. and trying to track down the new ministers in the government and arrange appointments for our never-ending uh, flow of U.S. senior officials from both the State Department, Department of Defense, from every agency uh, that wanted uh, information about Afghanistan. They found their way there, and I was the first political officer, um, mm-hmm. was the person in charge of getting all the appointments with the the government and then writing cables back to Washington about what all happened. So mm-hmm. it was a very, very busy time, and thinking yeah. back on it and going back through diaries about uh, you know the numbers of people that were arriving and what was going on, and the hope, of course, that uh, uh, things could settle down in Afghanistan after first an eight-year war with the Soviets, then a four-year uh, war among the Mujahideen, the freedom fighters, the uh, yeah. warlords, uh, that then led to the uh, to the rise of this group uh, that called themselves the Taliban, mm-hmm. and the remarkable quickness, actually, in which they took over the country back in 1996. Yeah. And then they left uh, as the U.S. Uh, came in in, uh, in uh, no, well, October of 2001. And then mm-hmm. uh, by November of 2001, they had pretty well cleared out of Afghanistan or, and were over in the sanctuary areas in Pakistan. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I mean, as you've described, it's just such a complex web of different things that have been happening. And, you know, I'm fascinated that you're describing, you know, the, the scenario of, of reopening this embassy and, and, and just the very bare, basic, literally bare bones. I can remember some pictures you shared of the dust that had settled for years and years. And, you know, gosh, it, it just must be, I can imagine, I can only imagine that, you know, from your perspective now, watching these events in the last few months with the closing of it. Uh, now, at the end of the day, of course, we know we stayed there too long. We were not able to do, you know, maybe what we idealistically thought could happen. And in retrospect, you know, some important lessons to be learned. Uh, I myself, I'm, as you were describing, Joe, I was fascinated because I'm, I'm finishing a book. I want to just mention it to it. I'll, I'll show you a picture of it here. It's called, oh, I don't know if it's called How to Hide an Empire. And it's one of these stories about what we don't learn in school here. The United States obviously has global interests. And, you know, by the mid to late 19th century, I mean, we had expanded. But it wasn't somehow built into our, you know, I don't know, mindset. And, and even today, Americans don't see that we are an empire. And we, that's a loaded word, of course. But what we mean is that, of course, the U.S. had colonies around the world. But remarkably, in this book's main point is that we kind of tried to hide it. We didn't kind of act like we, you know, owned up to it. And, you know, you look at the engagement in this part of the world. And, of course, going back, uh, we have to remember, you know, the attacks uh, who were one thing. And then course, what began to happen, and part of, you can continue the story, I mean, you, you found yourself suddenly seeing U.S. foreign policy shifting from this uh, focus on Afghanistan and, and, and dealing with, you know, uh, the individual, Osama bin Laden, who was seen as, you know, the mastermind of these terror attacks. Suddenly, within a short time, we're putting all our energy and focus on Iraq and mm-hmm. this massive invasion that was, you know, very controversial and contentious at the time and obviously, obviously ever since. Uh, but that would, of course, create a lot of turmoil within our diplomatic service, 
you yourself found yourself with this very difficult uh, decision to effectively resign, or resign a post in, in the, in the you know, yeah. senior level of diplomacy. And, uh, and maybe we can share a copy of this book that uh, you would go on to, to co-author in uh, entitled Dissent, where you're looking at, uh, again, a range of uh, high profile officials. So tell us a little bit about that story, because that, again, is some of the context of what would shift your own life uh, out of so many years of government service, suddenly mm -hmm. to take a look at policy and say, wait a minute, what's going on? You've now become a voice of conscience, uh, very much uh, an important dissenting voice about our foreign policy. So tell us a little bit more about what would follow after your experience there. From <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, after I left uh, Afghanistan, after six months in Afghanistan, and after uh, observing that Afghanistan was not really getting the full attention of Washington, that we were asking for things uh, uh, we were wondering when programs such as road building, school building, things like that were going to start, and we were getting not much information out of Washington. And yeah. when I would uh, call friends that were back in Washington and say, what's going on? We're not getting any any uh, feedback from this. They said, well, there are other things going on. Well, what it was was the buildup in the Middle East of U.S. forces that later on became, in, in March of 2003, the invasion forces. And by that time, I had I had moved on to my permanent assignment, which was yeah. as the deputy ambassador in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. yes. And it was from there, you know, observing what was happening and uh, being asked from Washington to go to the Mongolian government, as all diplomats were at, asked to go to their host country mm -hmm. government to ask for uh, people, uh, military, to join the coalition of the willing. Well, I was having a very difficult time of rationalizing what the U.S. was doing and uh, talking about uh, having military operations in Iraq. You know, by that time, uh, there was 10 years past uh, the Gulf War I. The United States had all, had all sorts of inspectors in Iraq. They had uh, the, the majority of the weapons of mass destruction inspectors uh, from the AEIA uh, were actually CIA intelligence people. So the U.S. government knew exactly what was in Iraq, what wasn't there. And uh, there were people in those intelligence positions telling the Bush administration there are no weapons of mass destruction. But as we now later know, the, the decision was being made just uh, that the project for the new American century was to go into as many countries, like, like seven of them were identified, that the United States needed to overthrow. And that's what happened. And as in the lead up to that, I I was saying this, you know, we know what happens with these wars. I mean, uh, tens of thousands of people get killed in them. Uh, of course, American soldiers get killed, but the the civilians that get killed, the numbers. And I I finally just said, I I cannot be a part of this. And I became one of three U.S. diplomats that resigned. Uh, before the, the war started. Uh, mine was right on the cusp of the war. I kept hoping that, please, let's not do this. You know, maybe the, the, the political pressure was going to be sufficient for whatever it was that Washington wanted, the, the Saddam Hussein regime to leave, whatever. Uh, but it wasn't. And so I resigned. And uh, since then, I've been uh, challenging U.S. policies, no matter what party's in power. I'm an equal opportunity crit critic. And the whole issue of what was going on in Afghanistan, and I went back to Afghanistan several times uh, as a private citizen and talked with lots of people all over the country. I was also in Pakistan several different times uh, uh, talking with families whose loved ones had been killed by U.S. drones, as, as we call them, assassin drones, these drones that are now located in, in Hawaii. Yeah. Just two weeks ago, the very first of two out of six have arrived, and it's, as a citizen, I'm questioning what in the world are these types of, of uh, drones doing in Hawaii? Uh, we're 2,640 miles from the nearest landmass, so what are those drones doing here? But the bottom line was that um, you know, there were lots and lots of critics of uh, what the U.S. was doing in Afghanistan, uh, the whole issue of, of nation building, which the Bush administration said in the beginning, of course, we're not going to do that. But um, that's a part of 
whenever a military goes in, they try to do some good works for the people as they unfortunately are killing some of them. So there's always a nation part, nation building part of any military operation. And it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's as the, uh, the contracts, the amount of money that started flowing from the Congress uh, meant that there were huge, huge contracts, multi-million dollar contracts. There, there was a lot of money that went into Afghanistan and a lot of the Afghans uh, say, where did it go? Uh, the, the percentage that U.S. contractors take off the top is anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. So there's not a whole lot of it that actually gets to the country itself. Uh, but then once, once that part, where did it go? And of course, there are allegations that uh, there was corruption within the Afghanistan government. I'm sure there was. And in fact, the special, uh, special ins inspector general uh, for reconstruction for Afghanistan, uh, who does a quarterly report, and he did his last one in August, which was uh, yet one more scathing report on accountability of uh, funds that were used there, and also accountability on the whole strategy that the U.S. government had used through 20 years, three different presidents um, of, um, of strategy to what end. No, again, and I mean, you touch on the reality is such a, I don't know, it's almost like it takes on a life of itself. You know, we go in with certain intentions and then, you know, some, some of them very valuable, noble, uh, but gradually it, be, it becomes this, uh, I don't know, reinforcing uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned like the military conduct. Pretty soon you've got so many vested interests that they almost have an interest in keeping it going uh, mm -hmm. over the years and, oh, just a little more training, a little more, we just, oh, and, and even in the past, let's say, couple of years, we need to leave. Well, if we can just leave a small print, footprint, and then when do we mount? Oh, just a mess. But uh, of course, I recall too at the time as, as a professor, then uh, you know, teaching about these issues, the, the tensions with the international community, because it was one thing way back, and I'm talking what now, 30 years ago. I'm guessing it was that you know the the, the invasion of uh, Kuwait that uh, Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. had done. It was a groundswell of international support. Then you know, President Bush Senior got basically the world community behind him, and he led this effort. Not quite the same with his son. Uh, there was a lot of pushback from, you know, the Europeans, from other, I remember on the Security Council, there were, I think, Chile and Mexico from Latin America. And I remember uh, some of my students saying, well, why aren't they supporting us? You know, we do so much for them. And then, I, well, of course, any Latin American will know the history of U.S. intervention and a lot of skepticism about U.S., uh, and, you know, intervention, et cetera. But, um, you know, the world was obviously skeptical because, wait a minute, let's give a chance to, you know, the dialogue and diplomacy. Well, didn't go over too well with the then administration in the U.S. So uh, we found ourselves suddenly, boom, you know, going into a, a very unpopular war without the support of the world community. Now, uh, Afghanistan, again, set aside Iraq for now, because that's, of course, Afghanistan is this other challenge because we, while we had a you know, large international community there engaged as well, um, and maybe just... A, Continue a lot of, you know, here we are 20 years hence from that other period that you described reopening. Um, here we are now. And of course, on one hand, a lot of things don't change. But on the other hand, you know, Afghanistan has experienced suddenly a relative openness and, and you know, even the role of women in particular. And, you know, from our own ECO Center, we've had a lot of engagement, different programs and, you know, citizen diplomacy, different things like that. It's difficult for me to imagine, you know, how this same group that suddenly is back in power, are they going to take us back to 1996, 98, when they first ruled? Because clearly we have new technologies now. We have people who've grown up in a different world. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I wonder, you know, if you could just reflect on, I mean, where do you see Afghanistan now and in, in the coming years, uh, given some of these more recent changes, uh, is, is there, you know, is there likely to be an implosion within, uh, you know, even this thing we call the Taliban, they're back. But it seems like it uh, doesn't look like they brought a whole new agenda. It looks like they're, you know, they're back in power because they, they sort of were able to outlast us in some way. What do you see in the current dynamics and maybe what we can anticipate in the, in the coming years ahead of what, what, what to expect? Well, I think there are two parts to it. One is the urban part. One is the rural part. And it was yeah. the same for 20 years when uh, the U.S. Uh, sponsored government was in power. Things happen in the urban areas. That's where the education took place. A lot of business uh, businesses grew up. Uh, it became a much more 
westernized uh, uh, society. Uh, yet when you went out in the rural areas, it hadn't really changed much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even though the U.S. said, you know, we're, we have uh, so many millions of young girls and young boys in school. Well, when you really looked at the statistics, there were big gaps in that. And that yeah. in many of the uh, uh, outlying areas uh, where the conservative, uh, I wouldn't even call them Taliban, it's just the conservative nature of rural Afghanistan was ruling and they, they were not having their young girls go to school. Uh, the women still wore burqas, which, you know, to us, it's like, oh, my God, why would you wear that? But, uh, you know, he talked to a lot of Afghan women. They say, we wear it a lot for protection. It's a, it's a protection. And, uh, uh, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't like it, but a lot of Afghan women uh, in the rural area say, we, we will get, continue to wear this. That's part of our culture. Uh, so to get into our minds that there are uh, differences uh, still, even after 20 years of the United States really pushing its agenda, um, and I think a very good agenda in many ways that certainly uh, uh, the opportunity for education, for better health, all these sorts of things, one would certainly hope that the, the Taliban government will continue on. The senior leadership of the Taliban government, which really hasn't spent much time in, in Afghanistan in the last 20 years, they've been either in, uh, in Pakistan or in the last five years, once talk started with the United States, uh, they've been living a pretty good life in Doha, Qatar. And yeah. in fact, one of the questions I always have is, uh, how about the, the kids of those uh, senior uh, Afghan uh, Taliban while they were in Doha? Were those kids going to school? And I bet you they were. I bet you they were going to some, uh, some type of uh, international school. It may have been an international religious school, but uh, it may not. So on one level, there is, there is the thought that maybe uh, the, at the senior level in Kabul and at the, the, the major cities, hopefully these folks who have seen a different way of living, and, and it's a Middle Eastern way of living, it's not the totally Western way of living, that indeed they may bring some of these ideas back to open up the society a little more than what probably will happen out in the rural areas where the same people are still in charge, it's, and the conservative people are in charge, and they're not going to be changing things. Uh, so trying to get in our minds that there is this dichotomy uh, within the country and we keep our fingers crossed that uh, human rights violations won't occur and that the brutality that we'd seen uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago in, in 1996 to 2001 uh, won't occur. Uh, the Taliban is kind of over a financial barrel right now because the the, the finances that are needed to actually run the country are being uh, frozen. I don't agree with that, quite honestly. I, I think it, whoever's in charge has to have some money to run the country, to keep the lights on, to keep the water going, and things like that. So I, I have been, uh, in my writings, I encourage the U.S. government to release the funds that are Afghanistan's funds. They're not ours. They just happen to be in a U.S. bank. They should be released, and the United Nations should start releasing funds so that they can pay the electric bill. They owe over $90 million to the Central Asian countries around them that normally furnish electricity. And, you know, once the lights go off and it's starting to, the fall is getting there, the winters are very brutal in Afghanistan. And they need to, they need to pay the teachers, they need to pay the, the medical people, they need electricity. There, the government has to continue its functions. And mm -hmm. the, the Taliban was in charge of the government for five years and kept things going. Of course, I will say that when they left in 2001, they took the bank with them. <laughs> and when the new administration came in, I can remember the, the discussions with uh, Hamid Karzai, uh, all of them like, uh, the, and they said, we don't have any money. There is no money left in the national bank. Well, in a way, that's that's what the Taliban are facing, except there is money. There is yeah. money that is uh, Af Afghanistan's money, but it's being held by both the United States and by some international organizations. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. And, you know, as you're describing, of course, uh, let's say the Taliban who were there before, they've come back now. 
the political scientist in me is just saying, at the end of the day, all political leaders in many ways are about the same thing. It's about survival, staying in office so you can do what you want. And of course, these leaders today, I mean, we can demonize them. And yes, they have a horrible track record from you know, the past and dealing with so many issues. But at the end of the day, guess what? They are the sheriff in town. And uh, we probably can uh, do more by either trying to engage them or more importantly, understanding that some of those neighbors are going to obviously need to engage in, and work with them, whether it's Pakistan, which, of course, had a key role in even you know, having, housing many of them uh, in, in some of those territories. But uh, in many of the other Central Asian countries, uh, there's a lot of stake. It's a very complex geopolitical you know, area. But let me shift for a moment, uh, and maybe in our final uh, discussion here, uh, uh, you know, one of the core issues of, uh, of I guess, government and accountability is this question, and, and it goes back to the title of your own book, Dissent. Because here in the U.S., we purport to be a democratic uh, system of government, you know, with the checks and balances. And dissent is so fundamental. I mean, at the core of, of the whole revolution that that created the country, uh, and it is understood, well, in different ways we can define it, but I see it as the expression or holding opinions that are at variance with those that are either most common or maybe even officially held. Uh, and of course, in a democracy, we have opposition parties, we have uh, opposition, you know, I guess, outlets. Even within the State Department, our diplomatic service, there are you know systems set up, and post 9-11, I think some of those were refined, that allow uh, you know, those who may have a, a, a criticism or a critique of the government to, to do that without getting, you know, their careers in jeopardy, because, of course, that's the real challenge. You know, why would you speak out if you're so, so maybe say a few words about that dissent as you understand it, as you see it in government. And then I'm really worried about today because we see this rise of authoritarianism everywhere, including the U.S., and that means less dissent. That means like pushing it away. So yeah. where, what, what can you well. Uh, dissent in Afghanistan uh, under the Taliban is going to be tough. It, there's no doubt about that. Uh, just as it's tough in Saudi Arabia, as it's yeah. tough in Qatar, as it's tough in Bahrain, as it's tough in Kuwait. I mean, it's not like uh, this is going to be different from a lot of the other countries in the yeah. region where dissent yeah. is not brooked at all. Uh, one would hope that uh, uh, women can uh, continue employment in government and as teachers and in the medical field and things like that. Uh, and that's where I think the international community has to continue putting pressure on. Uh, and that there, there are elements within the Taliban, I think, and there are, there are some members of the previous government that are still in Afghanistan, to include Hamid Karzai, the former president, the former co-executive president, Abdullah Abdullah, who was the foreign minister when I was there. There are some Afghans, senior Afghans that did not leave, and we hope that their influence on the senior leadership of the Taliban uh, it, it works. Yeah, well, absolutely. And again, these are things that are going to play out in their own way. And, and at the end of the day, Afghanistan has to figure out Afghanistan. We can only do so much. And so far, we've, we've helped screw things up quite a bit. And, and obviously, the, the solution is not pouring more money because that, that can just create different problems. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think, you know, I, I've been very grateful to hear your insights because, uh, again, uh, having been there and, and, and experienced this reopening, I can only imagine it's just uh, both, on one hand, uh, maybe the uh, distress of, of seeing us suddenly flee this country, close the embassy, rushing out, the violence, security, the uncertainty. Uh, it's just, oh, I just, uh, you know, the world is a strange place. And yet, look, it's not going to go away. We're going to still need to be there, aware of what's going on, yeah. with our eyes and ears open. And there is today a very different reality. Many of those, including in Afghanistan, you mentioned, whether Hamid Karzai or, or the former, or I mean, let's, let's uh, hope that they might be able to, you know, be part of the, of the future of Afghanistan in some way, even as perhaps opposition or partners. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think for the U.S., we need to step back with a little humility and understand that our big bully way of coming in with force it's not the solution. It, you know, it's created its own different problems. Mm -hmm. And now, and um, uh, we're coming to the end of this. And I know as we continue, we'll, we'll have other opportunities to continue our dialogue. I, I'm really grateful for your insights here. And you know, as someone who's done so much uh, in the way of service to the country, but even now as a very important vocal, uh, you know, activist, uh, you're involved with uh, you know, groups like Veterans for Peace, uh, the Hawaii Peace and Justice Organization. These continue to kind of push back and and help uh, both you know, dissent as, as you need to, but also create awareness of these issues, how we need to think broadly and in a more human way. Uh, it's not all about just the guns and bombs, but really at the end of the day, people and, and what it takes to, you know, move us forward. 
So I really am grateful. Uh, it's been a wonderful chance to reconnect and, and, and to hear your Thank insights. You. Uh, and uh, for those of us, we've got a, a website, uh, I think that you've got, uh, perhaps they can share with us here on uh, uh, Voices of Conscious from your from your website, where any viewers, you want to see some of the recent articles you've shared, uh, information on this book that we've talked about briefly, the, the dissent uh, uh, piece. Uh, and uh, again, and so grateful to reconnect. And uh, thank you for all your service and, and looking forward to keeping, keeping in touch and, and having you back on again on the next show. It's so, a real pleasure, Carlos. Thank you so much. Yes. So thank you for our listeners and stay tuned as we continue with our global connections. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you again, Anne. Aloha. Thank you.